folks coming in, so I'll just... about local and state issues. In April, we will turn our focus to international issues. Retired Major General James W. Darden will be our guest speaker, and he is going to talk about NATO and other global coalitions. He spent a great deal of time in the Army, Army Reserve, and was mobilized in Stuttgart, Germany, with European command. So we are just thrilled that we get on the schedule, and that meeting will be at the Pelham Public Library on April the 16th from 6 to 7.30. Once again, open to the public. For our league members, we've arranged a annual meeting for you on May the 23rd at the Homewood Library. That's where we do the boring things like vote on our bylaws and new officer and our budget, but it's real important for you to be there. And then in June, we have league member uh, Cindy Lowry. She's also executive director of the Cobble River Society. And she's going no, to take no, us- No, Alabama Rivers Alliance. Rivers Alliance. <laughs> and she's going to take us to the Cobble River and we are going to have an on-site discussion of public water issues in Alabama, and we're gonna have a picnic. So that's gonna be on June the 16th, Great. Saturday. So many of our working members might be able to be with us, and it promises to be a fun day and an educational day. So those are just some tidbits for our future, and we will maybe take a break in July and then come back strong in August. So, let us now welcome a, a very esteemed speaker who has really allowed us to be in this beautiful facility tonight and our new member, Joy Travis, 
will introduce our guest speaker at this time. Hello, everybody. Hello. I am attorney Joy Travis. Um, I am new to the league here in Birmingham. I'm not new, new to the league of women voters. Period, I've been active in Ohio. Um, and I'm excited to be here with you all today, and I'm excited to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Frank T. Martin, who is the Interim Executive Director of the Birmingham Jefferson County Transit Authority. Um, Mr. Martin joined the Birmingham Jefferson County Transit Authority in December of 2018 as the Interim Executive Director. He was chosen to lead this agency by a board of directors um, who are continuing the search of a permanent Executive Director. Martin's experience spans more than 40 years, um, which of course makes him an ideal candidate to lead the agency through this transition. In addition to a previous stint as general manager for the BJCTA from 1981 to 1984, Martin was also with the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council, the Greater Richmond Transit Company, the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority, the Miami-Dade Transit, and the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. As part of Atkins North American's Transportation Group Company, uh, Mr. Martin served as Senior Vice President and National Market Sector Manager for Transit and Rail Working with clients um, throughout the Southeastern area of Pennsylvania and the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority with the Central Phoenix East Valley Light Transit Construction Management Company with the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, GEC, as well as the Norfolk Light Rail Program Management and Construction Management Project. He has owned a consulting firm, which is called Frank T. Martin Consult since 2014. Mr. Martin is a member of the American Public Transportation Association Hall of Fame, and also has served on their board of directors and business members board of governors. He's also served on the state of Florida, state university system board of governors, and the Florida, Florida Polytechnic University Board of Trustees, where he was the chairman of the board from 2016 until 2018. Mr. Martin is a graduate of um, Tennessee State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration, as well as a graduate of Fisk University with a Master's Degree in Urban and Regional Planning. I introduce to you all today, Mr. Frank Martin. Good evening, how's everybody? Doing good, doing good. Well, welcome to our facility. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you here, this is, this is your first time coming to the General Center? Okay, very good, very good. Well, I, I wanted to share something about this facility. That when I was here in 1980, 81, um, Shortly after the shutdown, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But um, coming back to Birmingham after 35 years being away and coming back to this facility is really very, very phenomenal for me because um, I went to Washington, D.C. in early 1981 to pick up the first check from the federal government to conduct a feasibility study on the intermodal facility in downtown Birmingham. And to come back years later and see what has been developed here is just really phenomenal. And to see Amtrak, Greyhound, the Central Station across the street, and this facility, the person who had this as an idea, as a concept, was uh, the Federal Transit Administrator, Arthur E. Teal. He was uh, the first African-American uh, head of the Urban Transportation Administration in Washington, D.C. during the Reagan administration. And his father-in-law actually served on the Board of Trustees uh, for the authority uh, during the early days, W.C. Pat. So just a little, little history there. Uh, but this facility is phenomenal. So, um, you know, over the years I have seen the League of Women Voters in a number of different cities that I've lived in. But this is actually the first time 
I've actually attended one of your meetings. So thank you for the invite, okay? Now, what I'd like to do tonight is kind of give you a little bit of uh, overview about my background, how I got involved in public transportation, and then tell you about uh, the challenges that we have here in Birmingham, Jefferson County. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up uh, in North Nashville, uh, went to Tennessee State University and Fisk University, getting a degree in Master's in Urban and Regional Planning. And as I was growing up, I saw the impact of the I-40 highway system, which came through and totally disrupted my neighborhood. And it forced the relocation of about 35% of the people that lived around me, friends that I grew up with. And I questioned, how could that happen? How could this highway system that was supposed to be something in terms of uh, progressive and, 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 and you know, being uh, able to provide more mobility for the citizens in Nashville, but also those that were traveling through Nashville, it disrupted a very vibrant community. North Nashville, we had uh, grocery stores, we had uh, florist shops, we had shoe shops, hardware stores, a very walkable community. But as a result of the interstate highway system coming through, it totally disrupted the travel patterns within North Nashville. And as a result, I saw a decay, a gradual decay of North Nashville. So as I uh, finished my undergraduate work at Tennessee State, some of my high school friends had received a scholarship to go to Fisk University to get a, a degree in urban and regional planning. I said, Frank, you may want to submit an application. So I submitted an application and I was accepted. The last quarter that I attended Tennessee State, I took a course in urban sociology. It dealt with the formation of cities. And as a result, being a business major, taking a course in the sociology department, it really I was an outcast. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> we don't like those people that are majoring in sociology to be a part of our overall program. And I got a good grade out of the class, and they didn't think I was going to get a good grade because I was not a major in that department. So I think that kind of triggered me in terms of understanding how cities work. And it paved the way for me to go to Fisk University and get my degree in urban and regional planning. So I was able, once I started the program, we, we had a, a, a work study component where we uh, were working some of the local planning agencies. So I was able to do an internship with the Tennessee Department of Transportation. And there I began to ask some of the planners Okay, tell me about the planning process. Now, the planning process is a very long process for transportation projects. They're really anywhere from 20 to 30 years in the making, okay? Now, the highway system that came through and to disrupt my neighborhood, there were several alignments that it could have built the system but instead they came through the core of my community. There was a uh, Ford Motor Company uh, manufacturing facility. It was a glass plant. And over a period of years, they would take their resident glass and they would build up some of the low-lying areas within the urban core. So one of the alignments that they could have chosen was in the area where they had, over the years, um, taken all their glass and it built up the area. No, they chose to come right through the core of Nashville. 20 years later, this area was developed, what they call Metro Center, with uh, upscale uh, shopping and housing. Uh, but at the time they made the decision regarding the is the highway system. They felt that coming through the core city was the best approach to take. 
So I was able to uh, work on my bachelor's uh, thesis, um, having direct input from some of the planners and getting information uh, about the ridership. And I, my title of my uh, thesis was the impact of the I-40 on the bus routes and operating North Nashville. That triggered my journey in public transportation. So I left Nashville in 74, moved to Gainesville, Florida, worked for Regional Planning Council, uh, spent about three and a half years there, uh, left Gainesville, went to Richmond, Virginia, worked for uh, now a global contract management firm, and uh, immediately I was on a fast track for promotion. I was only like two and a half years. Then I got a promotion to come to Birmingham, Alabama. Now, I have to say that, <clears throat> I really haven't shared this with too many people, but um, I was very, very excited uh, when I got a call from my corporate exec saying, Frank, that's an opportunity in Birmingham. We'd like you to go down and interview for the position. So I called my mom, I'm excited about and this opportunity, and it was dead silence on the other end of the phone. And then she said, son, are you serious? You want to go to Birmingham, Alabama? Honestly, those that were not from Birmingham, haven't lived here, you know, knew the history about Birmingham. I said, well, mom, someone is going to get the job. If it's not me, it's going to be someone else. So I've always been one to take a challenge. So I decided, yes, I'm going to come to Birmingham. So I came to Birmingham within two or three months of arriving. The board decided they were going to shut the system down, allegedly for a lack of funds. Now, they had gone through two fair increases of service reduction. And at that time, the city of Birmingham would come in at the end of each year, and they would take care of the unfunded deficit. But at this time, in the fall of 1980, the city of Birmingham council said, no, Birmingham Jefferson County Transit Authority, you need to operate within your means. So the board made a decision, unless they receive additional funding for the system, on February 28th of 1981, they were gonna shut the system down. The mayor, Richard Aarons, at that point, made a plea to the board, do not shut the system down. Uh, the school board, who were carrying quite a few um, school kids uh, to school every day. Uh, Jefferson County Commission, uh, Tom Gore, uh, made a, a, a plea, do not shut the system down. The board says, no, we're gonna do it again. So they shut the system down. At the time that I moved in, I was like the number two person, the system general manager. So when they shut the system down, they transferred the general manager out of town. They actually sent him to Washington, the state of Washington. And I became the interim manager for about two and a half months. After my two and a half months, I get a call from the mayor. He says, Frank, we've been down long enough. It's time for us to put service back on the street. So I called my planner and in the office and I said, I just got a call from the mayor. He would like for us to put together a plan to put service back on the street. And I would like for you to get busy. And, oh, by the way, it can happen in two weeks. So we go to this meeting, the mayor called. It was a meeting of all the eight mayors that we were providing service to at that point. Uh, we presented the plan and we got the word that yes, it's time to move, let's put service back on the street. So within a matter of two or three weeks, after going through all the buses, making sure they were ready for service, on, Gen on uh, June 1 of 81, we restored the transit service. My planner at that time was a young gentleman who was working for us and he later left the transit authority, went to work for the city of Birmingham, uh, worked in the zoning department, I think, at one point in time. He got a law degree, and he's now sitting on the Jefferson County fence. His name is Don Blankenship. And Don has been a very, very close friend over the years. 
What I had to do at that point, uh, putting service back on the street, is restore the public confidence in the system. Again, the system is shut down for three months, allegedly a lack of funding. We actually had a million dollars in the bank. We could have trimmed service by maybe 15, 20%, been able to maintain the service levels. But the board at that time wanted to make a statement. In retrospect, it was not a very good statement, but one that they made. So over a period of about three years, I worked very closely with the board and the community. Uh, as I was leaving to go down to New Orleans, when you look back at some of the achievements, we had a new three-year labor contract, the first time the city had ever enjoyed a three year contract. We had a $5 million cash reserve in the bank. Uh, we had a new logo, Max, Metro Area Express. Uh, we bought new buses, and a new marketing campaign and the like. So it was probably the most rewarding professional experience that I have encountered in that I took over a system that did not have a lot of public support. The previous general manager, he would go to the city council, tell them one thing. He would go to the Jefferson County Commission, he would tell them something different. And then he would go down to Montgomery and tell them a completely different story. So here I am, young, energetic, exec coming in. I had to make sure that I told everyone the exact same story, which is really not very hard to do. If you are a true professional and you understand you know, your mission and your, and your goal, you need to make sure that you are communicating appropriately to your stakeholders and those that have influence over the future of the transit authority. So it was a very, very good experience. Uh, left went to New Orleans, Miami, San Jose, and worked for a global engineering company for about 10 years, helping cities around the country design and build their bus, but also their rail uh, programs. So when I look back over that 40 plus year history, I always think about <coughs> Birmingham, because this is where I really got my start. So semi-retired, I was having a good day, and I get a call from the board chair saying, uh, Frank, uh, someone gave me your number and told me I should give you a call. I said, really? He said, well, we have some issues in Birmingham. How would you like to come back and, and help us out? Well. Although transit is a large industry, it's a very, very small industry. And nothing is really a secret. <laughs> so all the issues that Birmingham was having uh, nationally, I mean, everyone knew about it. I mean, when you look at the number of general managers that have you know, shared this position over the years and uh, some of the issues at the board level. Um, so. Being the person that I am, I said, sure, I'll come up and I'll have a conversation with the board. And as a result, came to Birmingham, uh, had a great discussion with the board, they asked us very direct questions. I gave them a, a very direct and candid answer. In some cases, they probably didn't expect some of my responses. For example, Frank, what's the national reputation of the Birmingham Jefferson County Transit Authority? I said, not a very good reputation. Okay, and it just didn't happen <coughs> overnight. It's not gonna be corrected overnight. It's been that way for decades. But yet and still, I was willing to accept the challenge to come to be a part of the recovery effort uh, to again change some of the attitudes and perceptions of public transit here in Birmingham, Jefferson County. Now, when I look at what has transpired over the last 35 years, that's a long time, 35 years. But when you look at the 
what I consider the lack of commitment to public transportation. The ridership today is actually less than what it was when I left here in 1984. The article that was written on me as I was leaving said, Martin will not be here, but he expects growth. And it has not occurred. Now I realize there's been a population loss in the city of Birmingham. But still, when you look at a very modern city that's now, I think, on uh, a rebound, and especially when I look at the University of Alabama Birmingham and its growth, and then when I look at the residential facilities, uh, the older buildings are being converted into apartments and lofts, I really see that Birmingham is beginning to take shape after a long time. Now, being from Florida, we have Publix grocery stores almost in every corner, okay? Publix is very strategic in their expansion programs, but when you see a Publix in a downtown urban environment, that's making a statement. You may not really realize that. Those of you who, well, what's that? We haven't seen one of those here before. But I can tell you in Florida, they're all over the place, okay? They're very consistent in their product. Their stores are clean. Their produce is fresh. Their meats and their seafood, very fresh. And they have a very strong customer service program. And when you are in the checkout counter, the cashier always says, did you find everything you needed today? I mean, every single time that you go to the checkout, they'll ask you that question. So that speaks to their customer service. So when I see a Publix in downtown Birmingham on 20th Street, and I see UNB growing, but where is transit? This facility here, I think, is in the making of changing some of the perceptions of public transportation here in Birmingham. Now, we have the World Games that are coming in 2021, and you probably have heard talk about the BRT system that's gonna be in place for what line to crossplex. It's about a 10 mile corridor. The original grant application went in for 15 miles. It's a very competitive process. So the city of Birmingham and the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, were able to agree on a smaller alignment, a little over 10 miles. The headways will be every 15 minutes, and we will have electric buses operating in the corridor. That system I think could be the catalyst to really improve public transportation in this region. Now, the existing service, we have some problems. I'll be the first to say we have problems. The average headways, 40 minutes to over an hour. Our on-time performance rates are in the mid 50% range which is totally unacceptable. How can we attract riders to our system if when you walk out to the corner to catch a bus, 54% of the time it may be on time? And oh, by the way, 40 minutes or an hour? And if you ever get to work or school, or make a very important trip. The fact that you, if you ride there and the bus is already departed, that means you have to wait an additional 40 minutes an hour before the next bus comes. So 
part of my goal in being here is to change our attitudes internally, be more customer centric, and making sure that employees are aware that you have the community relying on you to get where you want to go. Now, I'm sure that many of you have traveled different places within the United States and overseas. And you know the efficiency of the European systems. You can set your watch by this service in some of our uh, cities like uh, London and Paris and, you know, uh, the Japanese and Germans, I mean, they really, really believe in public transportation. In, in Japan, uh, the rail system, they really pack, literally pack, their passengers into the rail cars. Uh, you may have seen uh, pictures of uh, gentlemen on the platform, Mike Love's on. And they literally are packing <laughs> passengers into the rail cars. And they were very timely. Um, 2002, I was traveling on a trade mission, uh, Germany, about uh, 16 of us, and we were studying uh, track sharing, the uh, sharing of uh, passenger and rail service on the same track. And we had a very, very short window for this transfer. And everyone, we got all the ladies on to the train. And one of our team members decided to step off and take a picture. And he was left on the platform. <laughs> OK. Um, but the Europeans do a very, very good job uh, in public transportation. And we have cities here in New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, that do a great job as well. But here in Birmingham, I think that as we begin to expand from the BRT, we need to make sure that our frequencies, and by frequencies, I mean the distance between uh, the buses uh, every 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever, that they're operating on time. Because when the BRT comes online in uh, 2021, we will be at that point uh, revamping our entire route network to feed into the BRT, as well as identifying other opportunities uh, for expansion in the region. I would say that during the past 13 weeks, all of my county, um, the re reception has been uh, very good. As I move around the region talking to uh, some of the key stakeholders, elected officials, about public transportation, I think there is a genuine concern that we need to do better. And I think the community is becoming very interested in what that might look like. So my goal for how long I'm here, and everybody keep asking the question, well, how long are you going to be here? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but I don't want to leave too soon. But at the same time, I want to make sure that we make the necessary changes to prepare the system for the growth that I know will occur. It's going to happen. One of the things I think is missing, and this is where I think uh, you can really play a very important role in this. Every city, county, municipality that is very serious about improving the transportation network must have a champion or champions. I want to make sure that I said plural, champions to speak in favor of public transportation. 
And in speaking in favor of public transportation, it means attending your city council meetings, your county commission meetings, going to Montgomery, going to Washington, D.C., and communicating that transit really means business. The impact of a vibrant public transportation system is critically important for economic growth. Anytime there's a major company that wants to relocate to a given area, there are three primary factors that they study very, very carefully. What is the condition of the educational system? What does your housing stock look like? And what about transportation? Now, we've seen the growth of the TNCs, the transportation network companies, that means Uber and Lyft. They are a disruptor. Transit has been very slow to develop relationships with them, but that's changing. And what you'd be hearing in the future would be mobility as a service, mobility management, microtransit. All of these are the beginnings of a new shift in how we view public transportation. Your transit authorities will become what I call mobility managers. Because at the end of the day, it's about moving people. How can you effectively move people in a variety of different modes of transportation? It's really interesting when you look at the scooters that are popping up all over the country, okay? Now, I'm old enough to remember a scooter that I made as a kid. So I took a pair of old skates, and I got a two by four with some nails, and I developed a scooter, right? But look what's happening today. These scooters are popping up all over the country as a viable means of that intermediate trip to get you where you want to go. So now we have car share companies, we have bike share companies, we have scooters, and then there's also this thing called first mile, last mile. And then follow me on this now, how many of you have a smartphone? Let's see a show of hands, okay? Smartphones are taking over, okay? So there is part of the mobility of the service wave that is a, a global wave where you be able to download an app on your phone and you want to identify how to get from point A to point B. And typically it's going to be the transit agency that's going to be the uh, controller of that app from the standpoint of I can get the point A to point B on a bus or a rail a car. But what if your bus or rail line only goes so far? So this is where the first mile and the last mile comes in. So I get off at a certain point and there's no bus or rail service. I need to continue my trip to my final destination. That's where the last mile comes in. So if you can visualize an app that says I need to get on the bus here at Central Station and go to say Brookwood Mall and then from there I want to go uh, further out 280. There's no bus service, but there's an Uber or a Lyft. So on this app, it would show the option to identify either one of those services 
and it would show the cost of this service. So you can identify which one you want to use to extend that trip for your last mile, and maybe you want to pay for this service also in that same app. So there's emerging technology that will have you also to develop that banking relationship so that you can plan your trip, take your trip, using a variety of different services, rail, bus, if anyone's sitting on the rail bus, bike share, car share, Uber, Lyft, all on one app. It's coming to a city near you. <laughs> it's happening, okay? That's the future of public transportation. I see Birmingham beginning to embrace that type of technology. It's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna take champions that are willing to show up and speak up in support of your public transit system. So I encourage you to really continue to watch this as we grow. Attend our board meetings. I would love to see you there. But they're kind of poor right now, okay? Um, someone said, well, Frank, you know, since you've been here, the meeting is a little bit poor already. I said, yes, that's the way I want to keep them. <laughs> but more importantly, I think, you know, get involved. You know, coming from Nashville, Tennessee, as a young, you know, teenager growing up and seeing citizen participation in our housing programs and our transportation programs kind of, you know, ingrained in me the sense of what I call paying civic rent. So as a professional, no matter what city I lived in, I always identified a particular organization, two or three that I could get involved in and give back to the community. Uh, my passion for the last 13 years has been higher education and that serving on a state board of governors overseeing your entire state university system. And then most recently, um, I still have about a year and a half left serving on a new university, Florida Polytechnic, which is a 100% STEM focused university. We are training the next generation of STEM entrepreneurs and leaders. And I tell you, the young kids coming up today are phenomenal, okay? STEM, that's the way to go. I just wish I, you know, could roll the clock back and and the opportunities that they have are just very, very, you know, exciting. So I think I'm talk, really talk too much. Um, so let me just kind of stop and say, we're very pleased that you want to call and ask to uh, come, ask me to speak to you. But more importantly, come and see our facility. Um, it is your facility. This is the people's facility here in Birmingham, Chelsea County. Your tax dollars went to build this facility. Those of you who may want to take a trip on Amtrak, you probably have seen the trains <laughs> move at this since we've been here. But seeing this facility, the connectivity, Greyhound, Amtrak, and public transit in one hub is really great. And when you really think about it, uh, I was sharing this with someone recently. Out of all of the intimate centers around the country, you guys have a hidden jewel here. I mean, it's phenomenal and there's not a lot of cities that have a facility like this. 
So let me just kind of stop there. It's been great. Uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions if there are any. We are so happy Mr. Martin could provide such candid, provocative, thoughtful history and perspective and context. We want to encourage Mr. Martin to get involved in the League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham, since uh, he would be a wonderful mentor for us in the area of transportation issues. Uh, those of you who have questions, if you would uh, raise your hand, and if we can't quite make it out, we'll repeat the question and then allow Mr. Martin to answer it. Uh, once we have made sure that everyone's had their questions answered, uh, we have some snacks and beverages that we would encourage you to stay here, talk with each other, and Mr. Martin, if he can spare a few more minutes with us. So, who has a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, since University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham is such a big employer here, um, I assume that much of the help comes from outside the core of Birmingham. What is the, uh, how, what has the transportation system done to bring employees in and to make it timely? And what is the percentage of people perhaps that, that use it? That's a very good question. And I'm not really sure the percentage of people that are using public transit today for uh, the work at the University of Alabama Birmingham, but I would say that uh, I've actually recently had a meeting with their transportation management person, um, and we're working to see how we can collaborate. Now, the University of Alabama Birmingham has their own little transit system. Within. They, with them. Yes. Um, at one point, uh, BJCTA used to operate that for them. I'm not really sure the reason why um, we no longer are doing that. Um, however, whenever that contract comes up for a bid again, we will bid on it. Okay. More importantly, um, the Officials at UAB are very interested in reducing the number of parking garages that they build. Okay, and in a very preliminary discussion that we have had, uh, we've talked about. As a matter of fact, I got a, an email today. As a matter of fact, uh, from Brian um, asking a follow-up question from the meeting that we had. I don't like to see what I'm gonna call, for lack of a better term, an eco pass. This is something that we used in California when I was in Silicon Valley at the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. And with this pass, um, San Jose State, the city of San Jose, Santa Clara County, and a number of dot com companies, be it Google, uh, Apple, Netflix and the like uh, would purchase for their employees a pass. It was for unlimited rides, and depending on the size of the company, it would be a per capita fee. So they would purchase, let's say, 20,000 employees, then maybe your pass is $20 per year, whatever. So 20 times 20,000 employees, whatever that number would be in terms of generating revenue, would come to the authority. Now we know that there would not be the entire workforce utilizing the system, maybe a small number, but whatever that number might be, it would be encouraging to get people out of their cars and onto public transportation. So we were very, very early in the discussions with UAB to try to set up a similar program. Um, they would also have a bus uh, 
bay over here at uh, Central Station so their bus could come in and have a connectivity to our buses. In my discussions with them, they also talked about the uh, master done research and a number of their employees live in like Cold River State. So we may be able to identify park and ride locations where they can park their cars, they get on the bus, and then we bring them down uh, to the campus. So we are really working to see what we can do um, for the students and their faculty and all the employees who work there. Um, we might just might be able to do something by the fall. That's our goal. It'll be a start. Mr. Martin. Yes. Uh, for those of us who don't live in Birmingham or live in Mountain Brook or Hoover or Homewood or Pelham, what is the focus that we should have on our local elected officials to get them more sympathetic to an area public transit system? Every trip does not need to come to downtown Birmingham. There's a lot of east-west traffic, uh, east-west trips uh, within the area, and north-south as well, but uh, to primary centers um, where the suburban communities could benefit from shuttle services that could pick you up in your, in your neighborhood and take you to the various villages, say, within Mount Brook. We did, we did have what we call the Spartan shuttle in Mount Brook. Uh, that operated, I think it was still is operating today, but we didn't do a very good job of marketing the service. So that's the only thing we need to do is make sure that whenever we identify a new service, make sure that we take the time to market the service. Maybe a direct mail piece or a social media or whatever the case might be. But also paratransit. Um, we're required by federal law to provide complimentary bus service within our network, within a uh, three quarter mile of all my transit routes for up to twice the base fare for door-to-door -door, uh, service for those individuals that may be uh, impaired or may have a disability or just, you know, as the aging process takes on uh, and you want to stop driving, there's a service that's available to you. A lot of the politicians probably in the suburban areas may not be fully aware that that is part of our array of services that we can provide. And it's also uh, a way that they could make sure the services um, operating in their area, uh, just the fact that, you know, having a conversation with them about that. Now, we act as a pass-through to Clastran uh, which is the regional paratransit operator. They pick up in their service area, drop off in Birmingham. Uh, but the population that's currently using those services in every city in America is increasing by leaps and bounds. Uh, it becomes a vital network for you as having an option when, as we get older, we make a decision that we no longer want to drive. But having a discussion with elected officials to say, look, I know that you may not be that interested in public transportation, but let me just tell you about this paratransit. <laughs> it becomes a lifeline for many of us to have access to get out when we want to go somewhere. Uh, and again, it's just another way of understanding what's out there and being able to just share that conversation to make sure that the elected officials are aware of that service. Yes, ma'am. 
What is paratransit and how does it differ from class trans and is it what used to be called the VIP service or what, is, what are the differences? Uh, paratrans is your door-to-door -door, uh, service. Class tram and what we provide at VIP is one and the same. It's a four, five, six passenger vehicle that may can have two wheelchair tie downs in the vehicle. So those individuals that um, utilize a wheelchair, uh, we able to call uh, and reserve uh, either 24 hours in advance or sometimes same day service. Our base fare is uh, $1.25. So for that particular service, it would be $2.50 uh, to take you wherever you may want to go. Um, so for us, we're operating within the Birmingham, Jefferson County core area, and Class Train operates in Shelby, Walker, and part of the unincorporated uh, Jefferson County. Classroom has its own board, separate from your board, correct? That's correct. And what if you merge the services so that you merge funding? Very interesting question. Repeat, <laughs> um, repeat the question. They might not have heard it. Okay. Um, the question was uh, why not uh, merge class trend and BJCT together in one organization? My chief of staff is laughing in the background back there. Um, as many of you may know, Class Tran um, has seen a reduction in their funding over the past year. And they have just, I think, appointed a new executive director, and they now have a reduced board, a smaller board. And we actually provide uh, federal funding, a pass-through from us to them that allows them to operate, okay? Um, and maybe at some point, uh, if the local area decides that there really only needs to be one organization, that might be the way to go. Um, I don't want to be quoted by saying, yes, do that. <laughs> but there may be times of scale uh, to have one organization uh, in that the Birmingham Jefferson County Transit Authority is a larger organization, uh, and it might be just logical that they could serve that role. And uh, I'm sure they could do it well. Yes, sir. As a partnership between private industry and mass transit, MAX, as, what about because of Birmingham UAB hospital system? St. Vincent's Hospital here in town, Children's Hospital, and all of the hotels around. You have a lot of people who come in for extended stay because of family members in the hospital for whatever reasons, for long times. What about a, a, a coming together of some of the hotels who would put up the money for the bus system to travel between their hotel and the hospitals designated trips to carry people to and from hospitals. You can eliminate some of the uh, parking decks downtown close to the hospitals. Uh, that would be a corporation, uh, cooperation between private industry and the MAC system. Very good idea. Um, we do have the Magic City Connector that operates now from five points uh, up to the VJCC. Um, and it's currently operating from McNown to 10 or 15 minute headways. Uh, when I was here, it was called Dark uh, Downtown Area Rapid Transit, I think we call it. We had the vintage uh, trolley type vehicles. Um, and we were very excited about those types of programs because um, it provided transportation for a number of hotels along the route, um, as well as people that park in some of the parking garages, because uh, we actually had services started early morning, and it had several pickup points uh, and some parking facilities to drop people off closer to work when you have more people working in downtown. 
I think um, at the end of the day, we need to really get out and do a better job of developing partnerships. That is something that we have not done lately. And that is something that we, that we, we really need to do. Now, I think the BRT route um, is going to go a long way in providing some type of connectivity uh, because on 18th Street, um, right in front of the Hilton, uh, BRT route will be going on 18th and also on 5th Avenue South, right in front of the Children's Hospital. Uh, we've actually had meetings with Children's Hospital just recently because they were concerned about the location of the um, bus stop that's going to be directly in front of their uh, facility. Um, but getting out and getting engaged and having conversations, how can we partner together? We need to do a better job in that, so hopefully we will be doing that. Thank you. There's a lady back here that has a question. Yes. Um, my question is, do you or do the other cities consider mass transit a public service? And as a public service, like our mayor is a public service, as our library is and our fire department, they are paid from our taxes. Why is it that we cannot use our district as a public service be provided for through our taxes? Now you suggested that we visit our mayor and Montgomery and all of those places. Believe me, I have been to all of them. At the core is the fact that our Constitution says that none of the gasoline tax money can be used for transit. So our going to our mayor and city council, and I guess what I'm asking you to do is to educate us on how we may approach our mayor and city council and our legislators to let them know we definitely better transit students and it has to be funded as a public service and maybe they'll give us another opportunity to have a referendum so that we can have money they have to they have in montgomery an empty fund that they have established we need to be able to go to our mayor city council and our legislators with an idea on how to put funding in that account because we need transit statewide, not only in Birmingham. People need to be able to go wherever they need to go. And right now, that's not possible. I'm 80 years old, I'm tired of riding. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, yes, uh, having been in the industry for 44, 45 years, I firmly believe that transit is a public service, okay? When you look at other transportation type services, be it aviation or roads, whatever, a lot of those uh, modes get their funding from the gas tax. Okay, so there needs to be a constitutional amendment, you know, to uh, make sure that transit can be a part of that uh, funding source to get money. Alabama is one of the, I think, three or four states in the country that does not provide uh, operating capital funding uh, for public transportation. And that's something that really needs to change. I, and, and I would say that um, while some of your comments may be falling on deaf ears, don't give up, okay? Uh, take more people with you uh, when you have those discussions. The numbers are always good and great. In whatever city you live in, um, there's usually a chamber of commerce, or in Silicon Valley, for example, there was a uh, group called the Silicon Valley Manufacturing Group, okay? And this organization 
um, that uh, all of your uh, computer your tech companies were a part of. And they really spoke in a big way um, whenever there was an initiative on the ballot for increased funding for public transportation. In Silicon Valley, you probably have about one point, I think, seven five percent sales tax that's going to the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Workforce as a chief property officer uh, to fund transit as well as highway projects. Okay, and the Silicon Valley Manufacturing Group was the entity that, when they called the meeting. They get their CEOs and walk out. Very special situation, but in other areas, either New Orleans or Miami, we had a very strong grassroots uh, effort. Uh, a PAC, uh, Friends for Transit, uh, they came together. Uh, work very closely with your business community and all of your neighborhood organizations. And again, it's a numbers game. You know, showing up at the meetings and not accepting no. Public transportation, I feel, is a public service and is something that is needed and you all should demand it, quite frankly. Yes, sir. I want to thank you joining us and sharing the wisdom with us. When I travel in one of different cities, I like to ride the bus. I like to see the city. And we have a whole lot of visitors here with the same idea to see the city. Whether it's to go shopping, go to the zoo, go to the crossroads, we want to ride the bus. I went to, let me give you an example. I went to San Diego a couple years ago. And they had a little group outside the little thing where you put your dolly in, get your ticket, get on the bus. You got on the bus, nobody can take the ticket out. But you must stop, got on the bus. Now this may not work for Birmingham, but you may, I don't know if they may even recommend it, but seen that in several cities. They get on the bus, they sit right there behind the bus for hours, know where they're going and get off. It's a public move. And it's going to take a lot. May I say this one thing? Um, we don't all fly, fly in the airport, but our tax money right now, we support the airport. And if we can support the airport, then we ought to be able to support bus service here. For address the zone's question. So that's called proof of payment systems, okay? Where you buy your uh, pass on the platform or a ticket on the platform, uh, and there may be a validator on the rail or the bus uh, where you either tap it or sometimes, it depends on the system and, and every system is different. Okay. However, uh, they do have fare inspectors uh, that will, you know, patrol uh, some of the uh, platforms and the buses, and they'll ask to see your ticket. If you do not have a valid ticket, you will get cited, and there will be a fine. <laughs> you know, so 
And having systems like that, what does that do? It reduces the number of fare boxes that you would need for your buses, okay? So let's assume that uh, you have the proof of payment system, you have no fare boxes. So that means that as an agency, I'm not spending the fifteen other uh, $1,500 or $2,000 for that fare box. You multiply that times the number of buses that you might have, okay? It also takes a technician to repair that fare box if it breaks down. So if I don't have the fare boxes, then I'm saving money in terms of the cost of the equipment and also the upkeep and the maintaining of that piece of equipment. So a number of your light rail systems that have come online in the last 20 years are all what they call proof of payment systems, okay? To try to lower the cost of public transportation, uh, which is a benefit to you as a, a customer. Yes, sir, Red. And it's fast. So what the gentleman is referring to, <clears throat> in 1972, when the enabling legislation was created and passed by the legislature, and even to this day, it remains the same. So you have a nine member board, you have five members from the city of Birmingham, you have one from Jefferson County, and then remaining three are from the three largest municipalities in the county out to Birmingham. Now, when I was here, Homewood and Fairfield had seats on the board. So every 10 years, when there's a census, that could change. Now, I, when I was down, um, I think I was in Stevie Hills having a, a meeting and there was a lot of discussion regarding uh, Homewood feel that Hoover kicked them off the board. <laughs> yeah. But the reality, I think, is that people may not have uh, known or understood that that legislation is there. So when there's a population shift, potentially the makeup of those three seats are subject to change every 10 years. And again, if you want to change, folks in Montgomery, <laughs> Okay, we can have one more question. What is the reason for the long wait time and the poor on-time performance right now? Is it for equipment? Is it not enough ridership? Is it uh, a well-being thing? Um, what are the reasons for it? And do we have to wait until 2021 and the new corridor to begin to see an improvement? I've been asking that question ever since I've been here. As a matter of fact, today, in our staff meeting, we uh, spent quite a bit of time talking about on-time performance. And to be quite honest, um, I have not gotten a straight answer yet, okay? Um, we do have a shortage of operators, and that's usually the first question, uh, first response I get as to why we're not, you know, maintaining a decent on-time performance rate. Which I do not accept that, you know, the fact that we have, although we down operators, but that's not the real reason. I think over the years, um, there's been a relaxed culture, a work ethic, quite frankly. It's not been customer friendly. And we need to get back to providing a quality service, 
by making sure that the operators understand the need to meet their time points, okay? Now, this may seem to be very trivial to a certain extent, but over the years in public transportation, when the operator come in to pick up his or her assignment on a given day, there used to be a clock in the window of the dispatch room, okay? And every morning the dispatcher around 2.30 or 3 o'clock or whatever, a.m., uh, make sure that they got the signal from the, was it, uh, I'm trying to think of the right term, but the, the standard time. Uh, right, right. The greatest standard time, okay. So, to make sure that that clock was right, okay? Now, in the labor contracts, in most labor contracts, uh, the transit agencies were required to give um, their operators, as a perk, um, but it was in the contract, a railroad watch. And this railroad watch had a nice big face on it, okay? Um, it had a, a second hand on it, okay? Um, so when you came in the morning, you would look up at that clock and you would set your watch to the standard time, okay? Now, I realize the traffic conditions are different, a.m., p.m., uh, also time of day and directional or whatever. Um, our scheduling departments need to do a better job of making sure that the running time in the end for a given route is appropriate, okay? It can't be a set, you know, say 30 minutes from end to end for the entire day because any time that you go out there, depending on directional traffic, it's gonna impact that time. So the published schedule that we communicate to the public needs to reflect an appropriate running time for all of our routes. So that when we say we will be at the corner of 18th and Mars at 506, that we've done our research in the background to make sure that that bus that's traveling northbound 18 will get there at that time. And we just recently readjusted our on-time rates in that uh, before we got here, um, it was between two minutes early, five minutes late, okay? So that meant that if the bus arrived at your particular stop, a minute and 30 seconds, okay, they were on time. Well, it's supposed to be zero ahead of schedule. We call it running hot, okay? In lane greater than five minutes is running late. Okay, so we've now tightened it up to zero and five. But uh, we do have a recovery plan in place. Um, uh, my staff uh, spending a lot of time to drill down and determine, you know, what are the causal factors and we intend to correct them because at the end of the day, you need to be able to rely on our service to be there on time to take you where you need to go. It's been a pleasure. You have one follow-up question? Well, well, the other half of that was the long, the long wait time. Are those because of the not on time service, or is that because we don't have enough buses or enough ridership? Ridership there. Uh, I think over time, with fewer people riding the system, rightly or wrongly, they've just extended, you know, the frequency of the service 
at one point it was probably 20 minutes and they said well we have fewer people riding as opposed to totally taking that bus off that line we'll you know change it the headways from 20 minutes to 40 minutes at least they still have a bus okay um now the board and senior staff, uh, we just had a retreat, uh, a training session really, about a month ago. And we had uh, two and a half days coming together, you know, addressing a number of different issues. And we had two individuals that we Skyped in to the meeting. One was the general manager from Houston, Texas. Uh, and the second was a uh, chairman of the board for Columbus, Ohio. And in both of those cities, they totally revamped their bus networks, and they came up with two standard service levels, 30 minute frequencies and 15 minutes or less, okay? And in doing that, they felt that in order for them to provide the level of service to the community, that they should not be providing anything greater than 30 minutes, okay? and they totally revamped their services. I presented a charge to our board. I said in my closing remarks, while I did not want them to you know, make a decision at that point, when there wasn't a venue for it, but I said, as we begin to make improvements to our service, we may want to identify Two levels of service, frequent service and standard service. And that just maybe we need to make a policy statement and not have any bus route operate greater than 30 minutes. Okay? So, what that means, making sure that you are covering the area that needs to be covered. If you have better headways, in order to get the people that we need to have on the buses, make the service more frequent. So we have to make those adjustments and those changes. So I'm envisioning that whoever the new general manager would be in 2021, <laughs> uh, that having more frequent services will be very, very critically important in order to make sure that you have increased ridership. It's gonna be very, very important when the BRT comes online that we integrate the remaining entire system to accommodate that. And in our budget process for this year, we are making few minor adjustments and we have a, a two-year planning cycle. So for the 2021, I will be presenting to the board and the local community uh, kind of a look ahead uh, for that second year, making some major changes, adding more service, more frequent service, so that they would not have an aha moment two years from now, but starting the dialogue now. But again, I would encourage everyone to, and it seems like you guys are very, very interested in this question about public transportation. So again, I would encourage you to actively get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again, Mr. Martin. We thoroughly enjoyed you. Um, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, a couple of things really quickly. If you have not joined the League of Women Voters, we encourage you to do so. Um, another thing is that we have some refreshments for everyone. They were provided by uh, Wing Out. Uh, Ms. Frenika Webb is co-owner, and I thank her so much for working with me to get that together. Um, and she just opened a location in Huey Town. Correct. So please go by and patronize their business. And if you have any questions, please see any of the League of Women Voters uh, members. And we are excited to have you with us today. Thank you.